at uh, our identity in Christ. As believers, when we look at the mirror, we shouldn't see ourselves. Um, if we see ourselves, then we're seeing the wrong image. As, as believers, as we look into the mirror, we should see the reflection of Christ. And that's his goal. That's what the – understand this. God isn't so much concerned about our happiness as he is concerned about our holiness. Did you get that? Now, I know we don't like to hear that because we're all about our happiness. But God isn't so much concerned about our happiness as he is about our holiness. And as we gaze into the mirror, the reflection that we ought to see coming back at us is the image of Christ. And uh, we looked at last week our image or that our identity in Christ is that of ambassadors of Christ. We are his representatives to the world. We are representatives to our friends and family. We are representatives to those who like us. And we're representatives of God to those who don't like us, to those that we don't agree with, to those that maybe make us feel uncomfortable. And we are to be Jesus to them, right? So this morning we are looking into the mirror and we are looking at our identity once again. And... Uh, I'm just going to say this at the very beginning. What I'm about to speak this morning and this portion of Scripture and the topic can be difficult because we're going to talk about suffering. None of us in this room, if we're in our right mind, enjoys suffering, right? But that's our identity in Christ. Is that we will suffer. And so as we look at this, I understand this is a, a sensitive topic and it can be difficult to process. But my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will speak through me and speak to us this morning. Uh, James chapter 1, starting in verse 1 through 4. And it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we know that it's anointed by you, it's been breathed out by you, and it is useful and profitable to us. And we pray, God, we would hear your word this morning, apply it to our lives. But, Lord, as we look into the mirror, we would begin to see the image of the one who gave his life for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We can find joy in our suffering because we know God will use it to make us stronger as we draw closer to him. All right? So we've been talking about identity. And before we look at this text, and again, like I said, this is a, a sensitive topic. This, this is an area that makes us all feel uncomfortable because again we don't like trials and tribulation we don't like suffering we don't like any of those things as humans we look for we want homeostasis right homeostasis is the same status we don't want to be too high we don't want to be too low we just want to even keel we don't we are like mama bear remember Goldilocks and the three bears remember papa bear's chair was too hard Baby's chair was too soft, but mama's chair was just right. Right? We want to be, we want mama bear life. We don't want it too hard, we don't want it too soft, we want it just right. We, there are weather, we don't like it too hot, we don't like it too cold. And God has been so gracious to us this past weekend, and it's been just right. So before we talk about a subject that we don't like to talk about, I want to uh, lay some foundation to help us as we look at this subject of suffering, as we look at this subject of, of, of tragedy and difficulties and trials and tribulation. I want us to begin with a foundation of who we are in Christ so that it changes our perspective when it comes to this subject. So the first thing that we must understand is this. God loves you and he gave his son for you. We understand in light of suffering, God loves you and he gave his own. And you're automatically thinking, because I'm thinking this too, if God loves me, then why is he allowing this hard, hard thing to touch my life? Why is he allowing this tragedy to touch me? If he loves me, wouldn't he keep that from me? Well, understand that God is about our holiness, not our happiness. He's about conforming us into the image of his son, not about our creature comforts. First John 4.10 says, in this is love not that we have loved god 
but that God loved us and sent His Son as a propitiation for our sins. Next, we must understand that we are a child of God. You are a child of God. That's your identity. John 1, 12. But to all who believe in Him and accepted Him. Raise your hand if you believe and accepted Him. If you raise your hand, this is you. He gave the right to become the children of God. Romans 8, 14 and 15. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. That wonderful word, Abba, is a Greek form of daddy. It's, it's literally translated dada. Even as adults in the culture, they would still refer to their, their, their dad as dada. It was a term of endearment. It was a connection of, uh, of between the child and the father. And Paul says, because of Christ, we can cry out to him with that same connection as his children. Abba, Father. Know this, that Christ calls you friend. John 15, 15, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he's speaking to us. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. And finally... As we look at this topic of suffering and tragedy, trials and tribulation, understand your identity through that perspective is this. God's spirit dwells within you. We take this truth for granted. This is the culmination of the Old Testament promise. God promised through the prophets and even Moses said, I wish that God would come upon all of you, right? The way that he had come upon Moses. And we see the culmination of that as Jesus ascended into heaven and he gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. Let us not take for granted what is what is within us gives us the power to be more than overcomers. First Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? Now, we don't understand the full weight of this as the early believers would have understood the temple was the place where God dwelt and lived. That's why when it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the people lost heart because that was where God lived. That's also why they didn't think that Nebuchadnezzar would take Jerusalem because that was God's holy city and that's where God lived in his temple. There's no way that God would allow that because, again, they looked at the temple as God's presence dwelling there. And Paul says, do you not know that you are that temple? God doesn't. This is not the temple. This is just a building. Are you with me this morning? You are the temple. This building is not the church. We are the church. When we gather here this morning, when we all us gather together, as we gather together, we are the church. You are the temple that His Holy Spirit dwells within. Everywhere you go, the Spirit of God goes because He dwells within you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So let these truths be the foundation as we see through the lens of God as we look at this topic of suffering and how we can find joy in the midst of adversity and difficulties. So in our text, James addresses his letter to the 12 tribes in dispersion. These are those who have been scattered throughout the Roman Empire. These precious saints were uh, encircled with adversity, suffering under persecution, both from the ungodly empire that is oppressing them and from their Jewish countrymen. They're getting it from every angle, whether it's from fellow Jewish people or from the Roman uh, Empire, they are feeling the pressure of suffering and adversity and persecution. Our identity as God's people means that we will face persecution and adversity. We do people a huge disservice when we explain to them to come to follow Christ is that it's just all wonderful. It tiptoed through the tulips. It's just wonderful. You never have a problem, never have a care. It's all good. We do people a disservice when we don't tell them that the road to discipleship is one of death and dying. 
Jesus did. He made it very clear. If you want to be my disciple, you want to follow me, then you must take up your cross. Cross is where you died upon. It wasn't an, an article of jewelry like we have today, right? You have big, gaudy gold crosses that people will wear and earrings and all of that stuff. At the time that Jesus lived, the cross wasn't an, a jewelry piece that you would wear. It was an instrument of death. And he says, you want to be my disciple? You must die. The invitation of Christ is one to come and die. You think, well, who would want to do that? That, that? That's not good marketing. I'm sure the disciples are thinking, man, Lord, this is not how you win friends and influence people. This isn't how you get a big following. What are you talking about death and dying? But Jesus made it very clear that when we sign up to follow him, it's death to ourselves. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, raise your hand if you want to live a godly life. I'm setting you up. For those of you that are a little hesitant about raising your hand, you know it's a trap, right? Because what does it say after that? Will suffer persecution. If you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. That is a promise. We like to claim promises in Scripture, don't we? But that's the one we don't want to claim. But that's the promise nonetheless. That's our identity. If we want to live a godly life, we will suffer. If we want to follow the rabbi, it's an invitation to come and die. It's one of suffering. Oftentimes we want to avoid adversity. But this isn't always God's plan or will for our lives. There's an article by the Bradley Hospital, and it gives helpful advice for those uh, talking to children about tragedy. And in the paragraph, it's the final paragraph, it says this. Remember that tragedy is a part of every life. Now, this is a secular viewpoint, okay? But they understand that tragedy is a part of life. So even as believers, we understand that tragedy is a part of life. The job of parents is not to shield their children from tragedy, but to help their children become resilient enough to survive in it. This is not often a job that anyone can do alone, and if you need help, ask for it from friends, family, clergy, or help you professionals. Even from a non-Christian viewpoint, we understand that tragedy is a part of life and to deal with it. It's important not to live as if tragedy doesn't exist. If we think that if we become believers in Christ, that somehow we are exempt from tragedy, we are setting ourselves up for a great failure. And I wonder when Jesus tells the, about the parable of the, the sower, there are those that the, the, the weeds choke out the life, the cares of those life choke them out. Because they thought that if they followed Christ that they could avoid tragedy and they didn't realize that tragedy befalls us all. It's part of the human element, right? That we live in the fallen state. In fact, that is the message Jesus or James wanted to give to these precious saints of God, that they were facing such difficult circumstances, that it is not abnormal and unusual. Now notice how he doesn't give much of an introduction. He says, count it all joy. And I'm sure the readers think, count all joy. Yes, that we're saved, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that he's coming back for us. What are we counting all joy? And then he bursts our bubble when you meet various kinds of trials. Wait a minute. Count it all joy. So the first thing that we see is that the Christian should rejoice in the face of adversity. Verse 2, this is crazy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. James is reminding them as the people of God that our perspective on trials and difficulties and adversity is different than those who don't know Christ. Because our perspective is different, because our identity in Christ is different, it changes how we approach things, and it changes how we approach suffering, difficulties, and adversity. The world around us seeks to avoid trials, difficulties, and adversities. In fact, they count them bad. They try to avoid them, and they say that it's like a plague, right? We try to avoid them, and, and that has kind of creeped into the church that if you face difficulties, then you must have been in sin. If you face tragedy, that's God's judging you, or you don't have enough faith, and all of the other baloney. Don't listen to it. There are more scriptures about believers suffering than we having a good life 
The early believers, as they were thrown to the lions, weren't having their best life now. Right? As they were being hunted down as animals, they weren't having their best life now. They were sacrificing, they were suffering, and they were in the perfect will of God. But we're to approach trials and difficulties and adversities differently. We're to approach it with all joy. That word joy means calm delight, cheerfulness, gladness. That's the opposite of what our carnal nature wants to do. That's the opposite. When difficulties come my way, when trials come my way, my natural default setting is to not approach it in a calm delight and cheerfulness. There's a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of frustration, a little bit like, God, why are you forsaking me, right? Almost this, you know, this isn't what I want, and we're trying to avoid it. There's not this calm delight and cheerfulness. That only comes through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That is not our default setting. But this is what we're called to do. When we face adversity, when we face difficulties and trials, we are called to approach it with all joy. I'm sure the readers of James' letter ask themselves how they could reasonably be expected to do what James is instructing them to do. I'm sure as they came to that point, they're thinking, wait a minute, we're being hunted down by as like animals. We are giving up family and homes. We're giving up property. We're li- at times they were living in caves. They were going from town to town trying to get away from it. And everywhere they went, they faced it and they couldn't escape it. And here James is reminding them and encouraging them to face that, what they're going through with all joy. How can it be possible? But here's the good news. It is possible. It's only possible for the disciple of Christ. An unbeliever, those who don't have their faith in Christ, have their carnal mind, and that's their default. They can't look at problems and tragedy and difficulties any other way than their carnal mind. But we, who have the Spirit of God living in us, can change our perspective. We can not look from our default setting, but we can look through the eyes of heaven and realize that there is something that God wants to do in our lives through this difficulty, through this tragedy, through this adversity that wouldn't be accomplished any other way. Only those who hold faith in the Lord Jesus possess the alchemy by which sorrow can be turned with joy. You know that alchemy? It's taking something that's not precious and making it into precious. Oftentimes they can make others, like metal or whatever, into gold. It's alchemy. It's taking something common and ordinary and transforming it into something precious and invaluable. Only the child of God has the, the power to and possess to change sorrow into joy based on our perspective and how we approach it. How do we change, take sorrow into joy? By changing our perspective when we go through difficulties and trials. It's our duty. It's our duty to rejoice in the face of trials and adversity because we know that God is our Father. Because he calls us his friend. Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because he promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. We can approach difficulties with joy. As the psalmist declares in Psalm 103 verse 13. The Lord is like a father to his children. Tender and compassionate to those who fear him. As a result, we know that God's plan and purpose for our lives is the very best. Because he's our father, because he loves us, because his spirit is within us, we know that he has our very best at heart. Our identity as his children assures us that he will deal with us in such a way that brings about our very best that he wants in our lives. Because of this truth, we know that even the fiery trials and the adversities that we go through, that they will not separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. One of my favorite portions of scripture paul declares this in romans 8 35 through 38 he says this can anything ever separate you from christ's love does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death as the scripture says for your sake we are killed every day we are like being slaughtered like sheep no Despite all these overwhelming things, uh, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. He goes on and he says, For I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Just listen to that. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. 
he lists some things that people thought could separate us from God's love, right? The calamity, the trouble, the persecution, being hungry, destitute, being in danger, threatened to death. Any of those things mean that God doesn't love us? No. Nothing. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. No matter what you're going through this morning, maybe you came in this morning and there was a burden. Maybe you're going through a fiery trial and a tribulation. Maybe you're facing adversity. Understand this. Nothing, not even what you're facing, is separating you from God's love. God's love for you is just as passionate, just as dear that you're going through this than if you weren't going through it. So we are adorned with this paradox of the renewed life. In 2 Corinthians 6.10, he says, We're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. That's the paradox of the life of the believer. We are sorrowful because we face tragedy and difficulties and adversity comes our way and the pain of life stings and it hurts us and yet always rejoicing. Our rejoicing causes our suffering to be adorned with beautiful tapestry of praise. We talked about it last week that as ambassadors of Christ, some of our best testimony isn't when we are hitting it out of all parts. When we are great examples in our mind of what Christ is, oftentimes it's when we fall flat on our face. That's when we are really representing Christ in all of his glory and grace. And I think sometimes our praise is more precious and sounds so much sweeter as we go through trials and adversity. It's all that we can do is to look up to heaven with the weight that's just taking our breath away and giving praise to him in the midst of the storm. It's easy to come to church when you're up on the mountaintop and you're like, man, I am almost walking on air. Me and Jesus, we're tight, we're good, nothing is going bad in my life. And we just sing praises and it's, all, it's effortless. Versus those times when the weight of the world is just crushing. And the tragedy and the fiery trials, the heat of that is beginning to hurt. Can you still, in all honesty, go before the Father and say, Abba, Father, I worship you. You are good. When you go through life's tragedy and difficulty, when it doesn't seem that God is good, doesn't feel that God is good because of what you're going through, can you still say, God is good. You see, I believe Job, the greatest glory that he gave God wasn't when he was prosperous and he had it all, but it was when everything was taken away and his boils were itching and bothering him and his friends were not the best friends. Come on, Job. Give it up. You've already, you, you sinned. Just repent. This is why this is happening. And Job's like, I didn't do anything. But yet in the midst of that, he did not lose his integrity. He blessed the Lord. I believe in that moment is when God got excited and said, yes, that's my child. Because it's easy to give God praise when everything goes our way. It's difficult when it's not. And can we praise him in the midst of that trial? If you can, and when you do, it may not feel like it. But that is when your suffering is adorned with beautiful tapestry of praise. Moses, Hebrew says, accounted the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. I remember in history class they talked about the treasures of Egypt. And here Moses counted the reproach of Christ's greater riches than all the wealth of Egypt. The apostle saw Paul sang hymns to God in the prison Philippi, although his feet were in stocks. It was in the midnight hour after being beaten. His feet were in stocks. It wasn't in a pleasant position. It wasn't a beautiful sanctuary that we're in this morning. It was a dungeon in the middle of the cell, beaten. Probably hurt to talk. 
His feet were in socks. And at the midnight hour, he began to praise God. That's our identity. That is what Christ wants from each of us. Not that we come before him when we're up on the mountaintop giving him praise. He receives that, but when we're in the dungeon, when it hurts, that we still praise him and we give him glory. John Bunyan, the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, was in prison for 12 years, but he made that cell a vestibule of heaven, and that's where he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. And countless others throughout church history on their deathbeds did proclaim, we glory in tribulation also. We have come from a wealth of heroes of the faith. Some we read about, some we've never read about, we will know about when we get to heaven, that have went through difficulties and tragedy, trials and tribulation, and their faith was made perfect like precious gold. Because they, they worshipped and praised the Lord in the midst of that trial. Our text gives a reason for such rejoicing in verse 3 and 4. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The first reason for such rejoicing is that it produces steadfastness. Why can we rejoice? Because we know that God is using this for our good. The steadfastness means endurance, patience. Constancy, consistency. We can rejoice knowing that God is using the difficulty to pr produce persevering patience within us. This speaks to strength and stamina. As you're running a race, there comes a point when you want to give up. You're running a, a race, there comes a point when your body says, I'm tired, it's over, just stop. And there has to be something deep within you that says, I'm not giving up. And you persevere. And the runners call this a second win. There is a breakthrough that happens as your whole body, everything is saying, stop. It is not worth it. But the will of the runner overrides that. And there comes a point when they break through and there's a second win. And there's a burst of energy. And they're able to carry on. And the same way... What God is trying to produce in our suffering, in our trials, in our tragedies, is this stamina that we break through to that second wind that God has for us. The runner never experiences that euphoric second wind if he quits and gives up. We don't experience the euphoria of God showing his glory in the midst of that trial if we give up. These trials and adversities produce within us a don't give up resilience that we need to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus. James looked at this as something that is inexpressibly precious, and it is. James goes on and he gives us a second reason for rejoicing, that you may be perfect. This perfect doesn't mean that we never make mistakes. It's talking about perfect and moral character. This is the end which God has in view for all of his dealing with his people, is that he wants us to be perfect and, and completely uh, equipped for every good work that we see in 2 Timothy 3.17. It is through suffering that we learn a, more about God and his power. If you've never been sick, you don't know that he's your healer. If you've never faced adversity, you never know that he's your deliverer. You see, what God wants to do is he doesn't want us just to read about what he's done for other people. He wants us to experience it for ourselves. He doesn't want us just to read about how he parted the Red Sea for Moses and the children of Israel. He wants to part the Red Sea in your life. He wants the stories of the scripture to be experienced by you, that he demonstrates his power in your life so that you know, not from head knowledge of, oh, I can answer all the Bible trivia, but I know it because I experienced it. It is through suffering that we learn more about God and His power and that it creates that enduring uh, perseverance in each one of us. Finally, there is the reason for such rejoicing is that we are complete, lacking nothing. This word for complete means perfectly sound. Notice James says that we would be complete, lacking nothing. What does he mean by this? I, I believe that what he means by this is found in Romans 8.28. To answer that question. And we know for those who love God, 
all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's a, that lacking nothing is that we will lack nothing in God conforming us into the image of his son. This is what God is about, changing our identity. When we look in the mirror, if we're still seeing self, then there's more trials and tribulation that needs to occur. So that when we look into the mirror, instead of seeing self, we are seeing Christ. This lacking nothing means that if we will allow it, the suffering will make us complete. Lacking nothing in our confirmation into the image of the Lord Jesus. How does he make us into the image of Christ? Well, he's got to chip away at the old image. So that the new image may emerge. How does, how, do, how does he conform us into the image of Christ? Through suffering. When we go through trials and tribulation and difficulties, he uses that to chip away and to sand away the rough edges of our life. When we go through trials and tragedy and trials and tribulation of all kinds, he uses that to shape us and to mold us. You see, we're the clay on the potter's wheel, and, and every once in a while, the, 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 the potter has to add a little bit of pressure to form what he wants in that clay. Other times, he smooths it out, and we love when Jesus smooths out our life. But there's times that he pushes in, and it puts a little bit of pressure. It doesn't feel so good, just as the potter does with the clay. But if we'll stay on the potter's wheel, and we will submit to the potter's hand, out comes the, the very vessel that he chooses to use, that he is forming in each one of our lives. And that vessel often taken from the potter's wheel goes into the fire. Have you ever made anything with pottery? I remember in junior high we made a cup and different things. And, and boy, it was fun working with clay. And this, you, know, you have a clump of clay and you bring something out of it. And then you let it set for a while. Because you're preparing it for the kill. They take it and they put it in the fire and they heat it up and they heat it up. And that heat that would normally destroy galvanizes that clay. As we go through the fiery trials, God wants to galvanize the image of Christ in our lives. That's the only way and it shouldn't surprise us. Because again, who are we following? Who are we trying to be like? Well, Hebrews 5 eight says, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. We say, Lord, let me be like you. Lord, make me like you. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. We pray that unknowingly we're praying for difficulty and tragedy and suffering to come our way because that's the only way that we will be conformed to the image of Christ is through suffering because it was through suffering that Christ learned obedience and he's our master and what does Jesus tell us that the servant isn't greater than the master they hated me they will hate you they despise me they will despise you they sought to kill me they will seek to kill you you want to be my follower Jesus says you must take up your cross and follow me the path of discipleship is one of suffering. As we close, we often attempt to avoid trials, suffering, and adversity. None of us like it. We try to avoid it as much as possible. It's our default setting to avoid pain. Right? People raise an eyebrow if you do something and it causes pain and you continue doing it, knowing that it's going to cause you pain. You begin to worry about their sanity because it's not normal. However, for the follower of Christ, we must understand our identity in Christ means that we will face trials and tribulations. It doesn't mean that we go out and seek it. it. doesn't mean that we keep it upon us, but we understand that this is the natural course of action that God chooses to use to shape us into the image of Christ. And we will face pain and suffering and adversity and difficulties. We don't have to be a, a, a surprised when they come. We don't have to say, Lord, or, do you still love me? We know he loves us because we're going through it. We must view them as tools the Father uses to conform us into the image of the Lord Jesus. And when that occurs, we truly can count it all joy. And I also believe that when we get to heaven, Scripture talks about this in Romans, 
And when we get to heaven, we experience the glory that we will look back and we will we will count all the things that we go through and it will be worth it. We don't understand that now. When we face trials and diversity now and difficulties now, we don't understand it. We don't get the big picture. But when we get to heaven, we will look back and we will say, oh, that's why I needed to go through that. That's what you were doing through that difficulty, through that trial. We will look back and say it is worth it all. Because we understand that to receive the glory that Christ offers, it comes through suffering. Before Christ was given all glory, he suffered. And if that was true for our master, for our Lord, for our king, then it's true for us as we follow him and follow his example. So this morning I want to encourage you, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, maybe you just got through a difficult time. I want you to look at it differently and begin looking at it through the eyes of heaven and see how God is working in you and he is perfecting you and he's creating you into the image of Christ so that when the more you look into that mirror, the more you're seeing less of you and you're beginning to see more and more of the Lord Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your grace that as we go through trials and tribulation, Lord, each one of us in this room, we could stay here all afternoon talking about difficulties that we face, tragedies that we face, suffering, persecution, trials, adversity. But Lord, we thank you that you use those, you harness those to work your work in us, to form us into the image of Christ. So that the image that we see in the mirror isn't ourself, but it is the Lord Jesus radiating through us. Lord, I pray that as we go through difficulties, as we face these fiery trials and tribulations, suffering, persecution, adversity, Lord, may we begin to see it differently so that we can count it all joy, so that it would produce your work in us, that steadfastness, that resilience, that regardless of what we face, regardless of what we go through, we will not quit. We will not give up. We will remain faithful and loyal to you and that you'll see us through and that we may give you all the praise and the glory as we testify of your faithfulness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.